All right. Well, um, just talking a little bit more about the meditation. Um, so a couple of things that came up, you know, we were talking about some of the phrases are very strong and profound for us and other phrases just don't seem to work with us, especially, you know, being happy. Like, realistically, we're not going to be happy all the time. So it's really more uh, about the, the wish, the wish you could be happy. And for some people, um, like you said, Josie, it just doesn't resonate at all. And so that's okay to play with these phrases and just use the ones that work for you or change them up. Um, and as we do that, you know, one of the one of the goals, yeah, is just to connect in and, and feel which sort of are energizing. And when they are energizing, again, as you said, um, and captivating, they, they, they have a, a habit of sort of pulling you in to keep you on the meditation object. And that's why meta meditation can also be a great concentration meditation. There's no problem in using this meditation as the object of meditation to develop samadhi. So it can be that. Now, with uh, the other, uh, yeah, I'll get to this working with others in a moment, with regards to working with self and really with others as well, meta meditation can be hard and sometimes by wishing ourselves kindness and happiness, it actually brings up all the suffering in our life. So it triggers, you know, oh, I don't have anyone that loves me. Or I wish I was happy, but it just seems to highlight where I'm unhappy in life. Okay, so it highlights suffering. Or the Pali word for suffering is dukkha. So it highlights our dukkha, which is our unsatisfactoriness of life. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that. Sometimes we need to really almost cradle ourselves in love and recognize the dukkha is there. So rather than pushing away where life is going wrong for us, where we're having difficulties, if we do that, we're acting with a kind of aversion and we know that pushing away doesn't work. It just keeps coming back. So if a difficult emotion arises for you in this meta meditation, then uh, my suggestion is to kind of, can you maybe turn that up so it doesn't get too loud, um, is to sort of cradle it in the light of meta. So the way I look at it is you've got this dark space here and yet, and then there's, and then you recognise that and then around that there's a, 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 a soft cotton wool or a light golden energy that sort of cradles that difficulty that we're working with. So in my meditation I can feel the difficulty and yet I have a sense of wishing that you can you know, find a way through that difficulty and find a way to peacefulness and happiness. So um, so we keep going uh, with the um, pain or the sadness or even the boredom um, to a certain extent. So in the first instance, we might just want to keep going with the phrases and push through it. And then if it's, if, if it's too painful, we need to sort of you know, envelop it in meta and, and sort of take care of it. And we have to strive for acceptance, as you said, Gosha, um, you know, to allow ourselves to um, see that and dissolve that, that pain and sadness if we can. Um, 
this matter meditation is powerful. Um, many people have testified this, including myself. Um, and so also have a sense of trust that this practice will erode those difficulties in life. So there is a bit of just giving yourself to the process and going with it. And look back after maybe a few weeks of practice and see how it's changed your life. Not sort of plunder and sort of trust the process. The other thing is when we experience suffering, we always experience in, in the sense of uh, time. A, a, a famous poet Relke said, something along the lines of it's it's not the suffering that we can't handle it's looking through the suffering into the infinite stretches of time that is the real difficulty it's when we have suffering and realize that this suffering may not end you know we have this vision that it goes on and on and on and that's really where the heavy burden is so one place to meet suffering is in the very moment. So bring a sense of kindness just to this moment. See if you can cope with the suffering in this moment. And you may find it's lighter and easier to do just for these few seconds. And then again in a few seconds time, just these few seconds. And then just these few seconds. Just do it moment by moment as you're working through the suffering or the difficulty. And again, what helps me is, as I talked about yesterday, you know, the suffering is a mental pattern that's going on. When that mental pattern releases, the suffering will release too, because you're not thinking about it anymore. But I see it as a purification. I see it being thrown up as a seed, and it's natural that these seeds will be thrown up. And then our mind takes that energy and turns it into a thought. And we think that that's the cause of our dukkha, cause of our discomfort, is because the thing we're thinking about is causing us suffering. But I flip it on its head and see the negative energy is coming up automatically. Then a thought wraps around that energy and goes to something which we can label as causing us suffering. And so if we feel that it's coming up and it's coming up to be purified, then we can just let the mental elaboration go, the mental fabrication, because the more we fabricate it, the more the seed grows into a bush or a thorn bush, you know, or a tree or whatever. So if we leave off the mental fabrication and just be with that negative energy, it dissolves more quickly than if uh, we start to elaborate on it. And sometimes we think we're fixing the problem by trying to think through it, but we just get ourselves deeper and deeper into mess. So just let it go. There's a time when you need to think about it and try to solve it. But really, you might say, this is not the time. Or you might make that decision, that this is not the time for me for solving problems. So before you even start the meditation practice, think, well, if these problems come up, I'm just going to let them go. This is not the time for mental fabrication. I'm just going to let it go and see it as a kalesa coming up to be purified. And yes, by doing this, you see it not as your fault. They're just vis visitors coming to visit you and then let them go. So that's, I just wanted to follow up with that about talking about working with uh, difficult emotions or difficult thoughts that may come up. Uh, and the other thing similar to this is when we have like the inner critic, like I can't do this. Yeah? Um, I'm no good at this, I'm not a very good meditator, this doesn't gonna, isn't going to work for me, or just I'm, I'm so crap at life, or whatever it is. Again, see it as a sort of a seed and surround it with metta with it. Um, and see it really as, you know, the inner critic is really not a great voice to listen to. Very rarely does it help people. 
um, a lot of us try to bargain with our inner critic to say, well, all right, I'll do this if you know if you leave me alone. <laughs> um, but then often the demands of the inner critic just seem to grow, and so you just can't bargain with it. You know, uh, my own experience is really we just have to just again see it as the chattering of you know the unpurified parts of our mind and just let it go like ripples on a pond um, and wait until we're in a better state in nlp we have a presupposition there is no unresourceful person there's only unresourceful states in other words if a person has a problem they nearly always have a problem in a negative state if you're able to put them into a positive self-confident happy laughing state and you say how's that problem not only do they say oh, it's not really a problem they suddenly come up with all of these creative ideas on how to solve their own problem people are so creative in a positive state get them in a negative state and they can't for the life of them think of any any way through this this problem so uh just leave it and decide to work on it when you're in a better state than the problem. To uproot self-criticism altogether, we also can turn to insight meditation or emptiness, realising there is no self to be critical of. There is no such thing as a self. So that's one way to uproot the, the self-critical mind altogether. Um, because what's really happening is we've got self-identification with a thought. We have a thought, we identify with it, and then we start being critical of that self. If we can get rid of the self-identification with thought, if we can just see it as this throwing up of energy, then it's easier to let go. Um, and then the final... Uh, idea that I have on inner critic is that uh, the inner critic is nearly always comparing itself to someone you know uh, I'm not good well in some effects I'm not good as who yeah so ask yourself who are you comparing yourself to because there's six no nine billion people in the world why do you compare yourself to that particular person yeah? Sometimes you've compared yourself to the very best person in the world and you're not measuring up compared to them. Then it's unrealistic, isn't it? So uh, if that inner critic tends to arise, then um, yeah, we can ask, who am I comparing myself to? And that can also help us let that go. Uh, we also talked about in the meditation um you know that we don't have someone that is our benefactor so as i said i often meditate on my mum who's passed away and you know that's a perfectly valid uh, person to, to generate meta to it probably helps if you believe in some sort of an afterlife and wherever she is may she be happy may she be safe and protected may she be peaceful and free with ease and kindness um, but absolutely you can me meditate on um, people that have passed away um, I think that's sort of all the things that we discussed in our meditation so any other questions that have come up all right well we'll leave it there and have a break and then come back